Right, I see you looking at me, Ty. You ready? Question number one. What did we learn about? Well, before you start, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we ask that you would continue to teach us. We are teachable people. We are here because we want to learn, God. We need to learn, Lord. So thank you for anointing this word, Lord God, this lesson that we're going to learn together, Lord God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are dynamic, that you are alive, that you are powerful, that you are awesome, that you are amazing, that your word is exciting. Thank you for opening the ears and eyes of our hearts, Lord God, and our minds to, to learn this night what you want to teach us. And thank you for everyone participating, Lord God. You, for Lord. each and every one of us, Lord, Lord, are equal in your eyes. So we thank you, we bless you, and we ask that you anoint all of our mouths as we teach this thing to each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what did we talk about last week? Joseph. Joseph. But what about him? <laughs> Who's Joseph? He's the 12th son of Isaac. Anybody want to give it a shot? Any good, good start, sister? Amen. Okay. Talk about Joseph. Okay, what about him? That he was a uh, 17 year old, rude and crude to his brothers and gave uh, dreams and uh, testimonies which infuriated his brothers. Which in turn they wanted to uh, kill him, but they thought better of it. He was also the favorite of his father, and his father bestowed on him the multicolored coat. Amen. So, who is his father? Who is Joseph's father? Where are we in the Bible? Genesis. Yes, we're in Genesis. Amen. Thirty uh, six or seven. Thirty six. Okay. So we're going to go to Je Genesis 37. I started Je Genesis 37. Anyway. So what do we have going on here? We're in the Old Testament. We're still in Genesis. Genesis is, is an amazing large group book with so much to learn. And we have Jacob who was renamed Israel. Amen. God gave him a new name and God will give each and every one of us a new name as we continue to seek him. Amen. Amen. And so what we have here is we have 12 sons and a father. And we have a father that's totally impartial and wrong. A father that is uh, uh, picking favorites, which God, thank God he doesn't pick favorites because I don't know about you, but I would be his favorite one, you know. Okay. You're following me. Okay, good. You have to own that you're God's favorite one. Come on now. You should be jealous for God. <laughs> He was jealous. You know, we are not called to be jealous. Amen? Um, uh, not jealous, excuse me. We can't play favorites. And praise the Lord that God is holy and that he does not play favorites. But Jacob's father, and let's call him Israel. So let's start up there. Jacob, a.k.a., also known as Israel. So when you hear Jacob, who is it? Israel. And when you hear Israel, who is it? Jacob. And what, which name did he have first? Jacob. And that he was given the name Israel. Amen? Amen? And so he had his 12 sons. In Genesis 37, 3 through 4, he was 17, just like you said. His father made him a coat of many colors. So let's stop right there because the Holy Spirit showed me something very interesting. A coat of many colors. What can we think about related to that? Any ideas? Rainbow? Good. Exactly. What else? What does the rainbow have to do with this story? It's a covenant. And so what about this covenant? What did the rainbow represent in, the, in Noah, in Noah's story? That he wasn't going to destroy the world anymore by water, and that it was um, life-affirming. It, okay. it was a sign. It was a covenant. So isn't it interesting that, now was Noah before or after this, Bible scholars? Before. Say it out loud. After. You know it. <laughs> Amen. It's after. So this happened before the rainbow, which is interesting. You can see, I mean, it's amazing the way God uh, just does things in his word. And so he had this, this robe of many colors. So I could imagine this robe that looked like a rainbow, something amazing. Um, Israel loved him more than all of his, bro his other children. And they hated him. They hated, hated, hated him. So the first thing is that God gave him a promise. He gave him a promise and he was wearing this promise around. Isn't that amazing? Do you know that God has given all of you promises? Except guess what? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It's in you. He's in you. This guy wore it. You have the Holy Spirit. How much better than a coat? Amen? Amen. I'd rather have the Holy Spirit in me than a $10,000 coat. Now, Joseph was given a lot of different gifts, if you look at the, the story of Joseph. And one of the things he was given was the gift of dreams. How many of you have the gift of dreams? You can raise your hand. Don't be ashamed of God's gifts. God gives me dreams sometimes, and sometimes I don't have them. There are seasons in my life. Amen? So he was given the gift of dreams. 
How many of you believe God will allow, will give you the gift of dreams? Uh, Why not you? You see, you got to believe this word for what it is. So in, let's look at Genesis 37. We're still in 37. Do you want to give him maybe something to munch on? Give him the balloon. Okay? Yeah. So Pastor Edwin discussed last week about um, him sharing his dream foolishly with his family, with his brothers. And he said that they were all these sheaves. There were, there were 12 of them, right? And that one of them rose above. How many of you went to Joseph last year with the church, the church trip? You remember that big sheaf? It rose above the 11. And all the sheaves, what did they do? They bowed down. So he's like, guess what, brothers? I had this amazing dream where there are 12 sheep and, and 11 of them, you know, were bowed down. And, and, you know, my sheep was the one that was high and lifted up. How foolish of him. Would you agree? He already knows that his brothers are jealous of him. He already knows that he's his father's favorite one. He already knows these things. So he's in a bad place. You think his brothers were loving on him? Do no. you? No. Not at all. As he's like the black sheep, but not, right? The highly favored one by his father but the black sheep kind of like Christians right <laughs> highly favored by God but completely I'm like on my own I have no family in the physical like physical besides my children I'm on my own you won't see my family like rarely it's nothing against them but I'm highly favored and, and I'm God's daughter but I'm the black sheep because I serve God amen. but not amen. I'm the light amen so are you so Genesis 37 5 he shared his dream and it's interesting, in the King James Version, which I pray that you're all reading, he shared his dream about sheep arising, and it says, higher than everyone else's. And everyone else's sheep's made obeisance, obedience, obeisance, obeisance. How can I say that correctly? Obeisance. Am I saying it right? Obeisance. What does that mean? Well, the, that's right. I'm, you don't, please don't read it. In your own words, what does it mean? We think of obedience when you obey somebody. If you look right up there, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Right up there. O-B-E-I-S-A-N-C-E. -E. What does it mean? It means a movement of the body expressing deep respect or deferential courtesy as before a superior, a bow, a curtsy, or other similar um, gesture, deference, or homage to his sheep. So in his dream, literally, they were all bowing down. Just in case you don't know what this word means in your King James Version Bible. Amen? See the O word? We have to get one of those pointer thingies. <laughs> Look, you guys see it? Yep. Right there. Okay, it's important to know what the words mean in the word of God. Amen? Amen. So, Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Now, I'm going to do a lot of paraphrasing because this is, you will be here until tomorrow. Which we won't, I promise. Okay, yeah. Genesis 37, 9 through 11. So he has another dream. Did we talk about the second dream that he had last week? Did we, sisters and brothers who were here? Yes. yes. We did. Yes. Another dream where the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars did the same thing. They bowed down to him. Now he shared this dream with, am I talking too fast or are we okay? He shared this dream with his father and with his brothers. And this time it was handled a little bit differently. So in Genesis 37, 10, and he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brother envied him, but his father observed the saying. What does that mean if you haven't read ahead? What does observe the saying mean? It says his brothers basically envied him, they were jealous, but his father observed the saying. What does that mean? What, what was he doing when he observed the saying? Here's your kid saying, oh, I had this dream, and basically I'm, a, I'm, I'm above and high and lifted up above all of you, including mommy, daddy. What do you say to that, parents? What do you say? This is the interactive How part. Dare How dare you? Why? Oh, my son is, <coughs> will put you ahead of me. I am the head of the family. Any other thoughts if your children told you a dream like this? And you know that they were seeking after God? Humble yourself. I'm sorry? Humble yourself. Humble, like the parent or the child? The child. Okay, humble yourself. All right. Anyone else? Maybe, maybe God chose him for something. God chose who? Um, chose, um, yeah, Joseph. So you would think that maybe God chose your child for something? He's after God and he's having dreams. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We have a lot of insecure parents in the body of Christ, huh? 
truly. I'm not judging anybody here. This is not a judgment call against you. I'm just saying, like, it's because our flesh, like, we got to die to this flesh every day, right? Because this flesh says, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? You think you know more than me? You know, why did he rebuke him? Shouldn't we encourage the dreams that God give us? gives us? Should we? I would be excited if, my, if God started giving my children dreams. I would be like, tell me all about it and take notes. And I would pray for that those dreams would come to pass. Amen? See, we, we got to stop thinking the way that the world thinks because we're not of this world. We're passing through this world. Amen? Amen. And so God may, ha may say something to your child, your spouse, whoever. And you may be like, they're out of their mind. That's your flesh rising up. You know, that's when we need to stand on Proverbs 15 and be slow to speak and quick to listen. And in all things, to answer softly. Because a soft answer turns away wrath. Amen? Amen? Because if God said it, it will come to pass. Amen? And if it's man coming, uh, there's a lot of people who are full of stuff. Full of stuff. Stuff. How many people, I mean, come on now. You all have been in different churches. You ever hear some people who just go on and on and you never see any fruit. Nothing ever is produced. If you're, if you're sharing a lot of stuff and there's nothing being produced, but then what is, what are you producing? Nothingness. And what does nothingness produce? Nothing. Am I making sense? Yes. So it, it, if truly, if God has spoken something over our lives, then it should come to pass. Amen? And we should pray for one another if we happen to share it. The point is he shouldn't have shared the dreams the way that he did. So his father was right in rebuking him. So to get back to the question I asked you, the, the observing of the saying, I didn't quite understand it myself when I was doing this study. Jacob, at first, he didn't appreciate his son's dreams any more than Joseph's brothers did. But Jacob, he was a man of God, and he also had experienced himself prophecies from the Lord. So observing the saying was realizing that what was happening was not merely the idle dreams of a boy, but it was the word of God. So you can't know what your children are talking about related to the word if you're not in the word. It's like... What are you talking about, you know? Like, I'm not gonna have somebody come and minister to me where well, you don't read the word, you don't pray, you don't worship, and you wanna, you wanna interpret the scriptures for me? I don't think so. I, I don't, I, no thank you, you know? And that's not a nasty, snooty thing to do, but we need to use wisdom in who we listen to. And what we also say, we, if you have the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will speak the word of truth. It'll speak of who? Jesus came to speak about who? His Father, amen? It should all point to God, not to us. Hallelujah and amen. Now, Genesis 37, 12 through 29. The story goes on. So with these two dreams, brothers have had it with, the, with, the, with Joseph. Father's watching him closely, thinking about what's happening here. And then we get to the next part. Would anyone like to share the next part without me reading it? I don't have to read it to you. I know the story. Would anyone like to sh share what happened next? Uh, is somebody raising their hand somewhere? Yes? What happened next? Try not to think of the show, because when we watch these shows, it's not all from the Bible, amen? If you know the book of Joseph, then you know the next thing hap that happened was his brothers went to Shechem to go and feed the flock. So the father sent the 11, which I find fascinating. Why did he send the 11 again? Shouldn't all the children work equally hard in your house? Should one do less than the other? Just because they're your favorite? Or should, the, should, the, should it be delegated equally? So just yet another example that he still hadn't gotten it right. You see, because we all fall short of the glory of God. Here's this holy man. He's Israel, father of the 12 tribes, but he still got it wrong. But God in his mercy gives us Israel as an example of hope. Amen? Now, what he did was he sent his kids to go and take care of the flock. They were men already. Um, and then he sent Joseph to go and check on them. Now, why did he do that? Any thoughts about why he might do that? Because he actually, he trusts, he trusts, uh, he have more um, trust in Joseph more than the rest of them. And why do you say that? I, I say that because I guess, I, I guess Joseph listened to him. And he has proved to him that he is trustworthy. And because of the love that he has for Joseph, maybe. Amen. Anyone else? So, so he has a track record on reporting on them anyways. He's a tattletale. Yeah, a tattletale. Exactly. Oh, yeah, so he's going to tell people uh, according to their gifts. Yeah. So he's going to tell daddy the truth and rat them out, right? Yeah. So here comes the rat. Yeah. All right. Don't be the rat. Don't be a tattletale. Somebody's doing something, pray for them. Amen. Don't go and tell the world. Amen. Because you're judging them. And there's only one judge, and that's the righteous judge. Amen. Now, Genesis 37, 12 through 29 talks about this. So he went to Shechem, basically. Again, paraphrasing, it's all in your word. And they weren't there. Surprise! 
-hmm. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So where were they? They were in Dothan. And um, he found out where in the street was or in the field was that he wasn't, that they were there. So he went to go see what they were up to. Amen? Mm -hmm. Would you have gone to go and see what your brothers were up to at that point? Or would you have turned away? What do you think, anyone? I probably just would have went back. Why? Uh, and because I, I don't want to, I don't want them to catch me spying on them, I guess. Amen? I would have went back as well, because it's like if they're not there doing what they're supposed to be doing, I'm going to go and get caught up in what they're doing. Okay. I don't want that to happen. Amen? Yeah? I would have went to them to see what y'all. You would have went to see what Okay. Anyone else? He's the only one that really concerned with what his father wants. He's the only one concerned with what his father wants. He's concerned about his father wants. So I guess, I, I guess he had to do because they were so so bitter because yeah. his father concentrated on him more than the rest of them. So it, it, that's what he boils up with because he probably figured it, is that they, they didn't like him anyway. So so that's why he's more interested in his father. Well, yeah, I guess. Thank you. Anyone else? So this, uh, there must have been some sort of pattern of them working and him going to check on them, right? This must have not been the first time that his father sent them out to do this, and he's proven to be faithful, so he sent him. And, and so, um, so they, they expected him, right? So I'm sure they were plotting and planning, even though the word of God doesn't say it, but I'm sure you don't just decide you're gonna throw your brother in the pit and kill him, right? That's something that's thought out with much thought and much time, much resentment, much jealousy, much fury, much anger. Right? Where you just act. And so he went, and it says here, let's turn to this, please. Uh, Genesis 37, 18 through 27. When God calls us to do something, we need to do it. Don't get off track. God trusts each and every one of us with tasks, different tasks at different times, and we need to be about our Father's business and do what he says, amen? Don't get sidetracked by your brother, your sister, anyone, your parents. Um, Genesis 37, 18 through 27, and when they saw him afar off, now this is talking about the, his brothers, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him, to kill him. And they said one to another, behold this dreamer coming, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, let us not kill him. By the way, Reuben's the oldest brother. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him of out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and they cast him into a pit and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, Judah was the fourth brother, by the way, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? So now they're stopping and thinking a little bit, and they're evil. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pits and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned onto the pit, and beheld, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes, that means he tore his clothes, which was an act of grievance, like you, you grieving, you're upset. And they took Joseph's coat, and they killed the kid of the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Israel refused to be comforted. And Joseph was taken to Egypt where he would serve Potiphar, the captain of the guard. Are you all with me? It was a big piece of scripture. So what do we have here? He's approaching the brothers. They're like, let's kill him. And then the oldest one, thank God there's some common sense in there. Let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the pit instead. Where Reuben went, I don't know. But Reuben disappeared from the picture, right? And then suddenly the younger siblings, 
you know, the younger siblings, they could be some trouble, right, with the younger siblings, the less mature people. And, and they decided that they would throw him in a pit and they sold him. Might as well make some money off of him. What do we think about that? Any thoughts about anything ring out or speak to you in this scripture at all? It was a large piece of scripture, but anything? Yes. Yes, uh, that Jesus was uh, sold. That's exactly right. Amen. So he was sold for 20 and Jesus was sold for 30, right? So there's significance in that. Very good. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver in the beginning of the Bible. And he was someone who wore a coat which represented promise. And he ended up in the end of the story being what? The savior of God's people. The Israelites. The 12 tribes. Amen? And we'll get to that. So it's very interesting that it was 20 and it happened at that point. Everything that uh, that happens in the Bible has significance. Amen? Amen. Um, if, we, if we look at the, you know, the, the 23rd scripture, they stripped him. They took his promises right off of him and ripped them off of him. Think about that. You ever have your promises just ripped out from you? You had this big dream to do whatever it was you were going to do, and it's just taken away from you. You feel like it was almost ripped off of you? Yes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You feel like there's no future, you just can't see, because it's gone. And not only is it gone, it was abruptly taken from you, against your will. And why is that good for us today? Because his life, this story ends with such an amazing ending, that's why. So just because your promises, and see what God promises is not something that you can uh, um, uh, hold on to. So if God gave me a house, right? He's like, oh, I'm giving you this house. If that house burned down, it doesn't mean that he's not going to give me another house because he promised to give me a house. Now, I could care less about a house. So maybe that wasn't a good example. But when he speaks a promise into your life, it will come to pass. And it may not come to pass the way that you want it to. It's not going to be sweet and easy and beautiful and clean. There's going to be some blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of heartache, but in that, God will strengthen you and he will pick you up just like he does in this story with Joseph. So don't be discouraged if you've had everything just ripped from you. All of your dreams, all of your hopes, all of, and you're never too old. And you're never too young, amen? Amen. Now Israel, when they went back to give him um, the coat, it says that he was not comforted. He didn't want anybody touching him. You ever lose somebody? Like, don't touch me. My father died. I didn't want anybody near me. Are you okay? No, you fool. I'm not okay. My father's dead. You know, that's what I wanted to say. Like, just don't touch me. I remember feeling that way. Um, and he refused to be comforted. Why is this a good scripture? Well, no, we shouldn't say, I didn't call anybody a fool, by the way, when my father died. But it's normal to feel, I love the Bible because it says what we feel. You ever just want to be left alone? You just leave me alone. Not forever, I'm not gonna run away, but just please. Sometimes, sometimes the only comforter, all the time, the only comforter we need is really God. See, because man and woman, shape, rubbing my head, rubbing my back, that's not gonna do anything for me. You could buy me my favorite treats, you can do whatever you wanna do, but that's not gonna make me better. God, our comforter, that's what's gonna comfort me, amen? So wherever you may be today, let God comfort you in your situation. Now, Joseph was taken to Egypt. And how many of you remember this part? Anybody? Anybody? I'm going to have a test after every sight and sound trip now. Okay. Just kidding. Anybody other than Corinne? God bless you. Good. I want to give somebody else. Potiphar. He was tested. Yes. So he ended up, Joseph ended up working for Potiphar. And you, that can be found in Genesis 39, 1 through 4. And even though Joseph was taken to Egypt, by the way, Egypt in the Bible represents bondage. Egypt was the enemy of God's people. And you may, be, you may have been taken to a place of bondage in your job, at your school, wherever, maybe even in your family. But God still goes with you there, amen? And so he was taken to Egypt, but he wasn't just taken to work in the fields and be a slave. He was taken to the captain of the guard's place. And oh, God went with him. And so he was blessed as he was taken there. And God blessed him with his favor. And everything that Joseph touched in Potiphar's house was blessed, including the people there, everything in the household and the fields. Everything was blessed. And he couldn't help but notice that this man was different from any other servant or slave because he was a slave when he went to Egypt. Amen? Amen. And so a lot of you have slavery mindset because you've been put in bondage because your dreams have been ripped away. And God is saying, you know, slave, we're not slaves in the kingdom of God. Whatever the world wants to call us, whatever. 
Um, we are daughters and sons of the Most High God, and we need to walk in our identity even when we're in that bad situation. Amen? Amen. And so he was taken, and he worked, and everything was blessed. Potiphar's wife had the hots for him, wanted to have sex with him, approached him, approached him. Imagine how many times she tried to have sex with him. That's not mentioned in the word. And then one day she had the opportunity because the house was empty and she was going to get her groove on. And so she went after him and she just knew like she knew like she knew. You know, like all of these celebrities in, California, in Hollywood that they knew like they knew that they knew that they were going to get their way with all those people that they molested and raped. Think about that. He, she had the power and influence just like, and it's terrible. We need to pray for the victims, amen, and for the people who committed these crimes against all of these women. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, she had power and influence just like the people, in, you know, celebrities. And she had all these people at her disposal. And she approached him and he basically said, I'm not going to do it. I can't do this to your master. So, again, I'm, par I'm just trying to condense it so we can get through the scripture. Amen? Amen. Genesis 39, 7 through 20 discusses when Potiphar approaches. She grabs his coat, his garments. She holds on to it. He leaves. He runs out. She screams and screams and says basically that she was raped. Right? And that was it. He was done. Potiphar found out. What would you do if you were, if it was your wife? What would you do? Men in the room? Would you believe it? What would you do? It's a tough one, right? We live in like this very just. But then, if you know, world. if you know your wife, then you're gonna understand mm -hmm. if it's really true or not. How many of you know if you have a flirty wife or a flirt? My husband used to be such a flirt. Anybody recording this? Always. <laughs> <laughs> He was, and it was like all good when I was dating him because I could care less. I was hoping he would do something wrong and leave so I could never see him again because I had been so hurt from my past that I wanted nothing to do with a man or anyone. I just wanted to be on my own. And the good thing is he didn't mess up until after he, we, we said I do. <laughs> no, but he didn't cheat or anything like that. That's not what I mean. Um, but my husband had a very flirty way about him. We would go to like these places and he knew everybody. I would go to the mall in a different state and they would be, hi, and they would come and talk to him. Always women, some men. And I would just be like, okay, and just do my thing because I didn't care. I wasn't like jealous over it because I didn't care. I didn't want myself to get hurt. And so I knew that my husband was flirty is my point. And you know your spouse, right? He's no longer flirty, thank God, although he wouldn't be here right now. Amen? Everybody gets so quiet with the stories. I used to be like, you're, you're kind of flirty. He's like, so are you. You can't blame him. I mean, it's good looks. I yeah, mean. amen. Glory to God. But he had to stop because that's not glorifying God being flirty. You're like, what are you looking for? <coughs> My point is Potiphar knew his wife. He had to know his wife. Yeah. We know our spouse, the state of our spouse. Whether we want to say it out loud or not, we do. We know the shortcomings and the strengths and all that stuff. Amen? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what it must have been like to be this guy because here's this guy who's blessing everything you're prospering everything's going well and now your wife says he's you know tried to rape her so where do you go from there mama, mama. anyway i'll tell you where joseph went right to jail yeah. it says that he was bound and thrown in jail and guess what happened to joseph so what do we have we have this son who's highly favored the favorite of the father not working the fields being the spy in the tattletale with this amazing coat he goes from a place of being high to being thrown in a pit and sold ah. into slavery to be put into an amazing household, to be lifted up again in charge of really the household, to be thrown down into jail again. How many of you feel like your life is like that sometimes? It's like this up and down and up and down. And so he ended up in jail, bound, where the king kept his prisoners. And what happens? God went with him again. Because God goes with you if you stick with God. The highs and the lows. So he goes to jail, and he's highly favored, and he's blessed. And the person in charge of the prisoners, what did he do? He put him in charge. Isn't that pretty amazing? So regardless of how bleak or dark your situation may be, if God is with you, you're favored. And you may not see it, amen? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> it says in um, Genesis 39, 21 to 23, and that's my comment, God is still with Joseph. See, God honors when we remain pure. He honors when we walk in integrity. It must have been quite a, I mean, my goodness, he could have had sex with her and no one would have known it. 
but he chose the path of righteousness. And we need to choose the path of righteousness no matter how much money, no matter how much status, no matter how good something looks, no matter how good someone looks, no matter what it is, we can't be lured by the, you know, the enemy will put status and job and money and this and that and the other right in our path. And if it stops you from getting close to God, if it stops you from going to church, if it stops you from seeking him, if it stops you from praying, if it stops you from worshiping, if it stops you from praising, then that's a hindrance. And it's the big white box with the big red bow that I say that the enemy likes to put in front of us. Oh, look at this. Go for it. Well, if I take that, guess what? There's God and this is the world and I'm going this way now. And so Joseph said, you know what? Don't you think he was terrified? He was sworn. What do I do? Do I sleep with her or do I betray him? But most of, all, most of all, do I betray God? And he made the right decision and we're called to make the right decision. But do you see that making the right decision? Yes, you end up in a bad place sometimes, but God goes with you in that bad place and he lifts you up again. Amen. Are you following me? Am I going too fast? Now, but the Lord was with Joseph. So th this is Genesis uh, 39, 21 through 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. Can you imagine? We get thrown in jail. No one's given us anything. <laughs> the way it is nowadays. Yes, God will go with us. I'm not trying to contradict what I said earlier, but my goodness, this is pretty incredible. Only God could do this. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Amen. People trust people who have God, who really have God, not this Christian crap. Sorry, I try not to say the C-R-E-P word from here. Not the Father in Jesus' name, I repent. I'm sorry, everyone. Not the fake Christians, because everybody's a Christian, but how many people actually walk this out? Like a very small percentage of us, right? So when you walk this out, the world can't help but see that you're different, and you have God's favor over what you do. I work in an office of darkness. But yet God still blesses me in that place, and he has elevated me from medical assistant to office manager to nurse manager to nurse practitioner to and i could have seen overseen the entire uh, network of west care offices why not because i'm anything good i'm not seriously but because god is with me and i continue to seek him and i didn't let position money status whatever i didn't let it get in my way along the path at some time in the beginning i did because i wasn't walking with god but as i got as i kept on I chose the path of righteousness, and I don't go back and forth, and God blesses that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you could say amen? amen. How many of you have seen God's favor in your workplace? Amen. Where everybody's getting fired, but you're still there. Amen. People are getting persecuted, but you're still there. Amen. God will make a way, but you have to walk this out and know that it has eternal um, gifts, right? It's eternity. Hallelujah. So he went with him there, and he made him to prosper in jail. So even though he was in bondage, he was still used. And now he was given another dream. So we said what? He was favored. He was um, his father's favorite. He was blessed. He was all these things. He had dreams, but now he had the gift of interpreting dreams. How many of you interpret dreams? Anybody? That's pretty cool. I don't interpret dreams. I mean, sometimes I get clues here and there. But what does it go to show you? Is God going to give you a gift if you're not seeking him? Is he? Is God going to use you if you're not doing work on your part? Is God going to say anything to you to give to anybody else if you're not even spending any time with him or putting him first? No, no, and no. We, this all reflects the fact that Joseph was still seeking God in the midst of the turmoil, that Joseph didn't give up when he felt, when nothing looked good, when he was in darkness, when he was bound, when he was in prison, when he was accused of sleeping with someone he didn't sleep with. You ever get wronged? You try to do the right thing and you get wronged? You know, the big screw, I won't say ED, but you know, when you really like, uh, great, I'm getting stabbed in the back, everything is going wrong, and I just try to do the right thing. That ever happened to you? Yeah. This was our Joseph. And so in the midst of all of it, he didn't turn to wickedness. And this is where we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us, because in there, he didn't know Jesus yet, but he knew God. And he, he knew and God well enough to know that God was real and that God was moving on his behalf. What do you have in prison a whole lot of time? I haven't been there, but I'm sure a whole lot of time to think about everything that's happened. What else do you have? And he saw God continuing to move and he didn't give up. And a lot of you have given up. 
many of us have given up and got back on that horse. <laughs> and you give up and you get back and you give up and you get back. And God is saying, I don't want you to give up ever again. Because I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And my promises are yes and amen. And my promises, they stand true and they don't change. You see, with all the storms and all the chaos and everything that Pastor was talking about last weekend with the hurricanes and this, that, and the other, God is not moved by any of it. Are you? You shouldn't be. Because if Christ is the rock, like we were praying earlier, then we shouldn't be moved by the situations around us. Not even the ones in our face like this. Are. Amen? So now he was given the gift to interpret dreams. So ha that happened in jail. So good things can happen in bad places to followers of Christ. Amen? What happened here? This is a very interesting story. There he is in jail, and two people get thrown in jail at the same time. The royal butler. <laughs> Do you know who the royal butler was? He was the king's butler, but he also would taste uh, whatever would be given to the king. Because if it was poison, he would die for him. Would you like that job? Not me. Throw me in the dungeon. I'm not dying for you. I'll die for God, but that's about it. You know, like... He got thrown in jail. It says that basically Potiphar was um, displeased with him. Not Potiphar, the king, um, Pharaoh. And then at the same time, at the same exact time, he must have been in a bad mood or had a fight with his wife or something. It says that the chief baker was also thrown in jail at the same time. So there they are, they're thrown in jail. They're stressed out. They're used to being in this high position. That ever happens to you when you're in a high position and then you get yanked out and now you're back to square one again after you've made all this progress? So frustrating. So there these people were, but they didn't have God. Can you imagine going through all these trials that Joseph went through without God? Well, you can because I have. I've gone through trials in my life without God, and I never want to go through trials without him ever again. Amen. Amen? Because he is the one that sustains us if we let him. So they're in jail. They're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. They both have dreams. And they had these dreams, and they didn't understand the dreams. And if we look at Genesis 40... One. <clears throat> it says, and it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and the baker, they offended the Lord, the king of Egypt, and they both had dreams. That's what I just said. Genesis 40, 13 through 15. Yet within three days. Okay, so he interpreted the dreams, basically. He, God gave him the gift. Why would God suddenly give him the gift to interpret dreams right there and then? Why? Anyone? Because, yeah, because um, that's where God gets the opportunity to de demonstrate his power. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. It says that, so he interpreted the dreams, and this is what his interpretation was. So, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup. And he's talking to the butler. Okay, remember I said he holds the cup, he drinks from the cup. If it has poison, he dies, not Pharaoh. He's talking to the butler. You, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou was his butler. He, but then he goes on to say to him, but think on me when it shall be well with thee and show and shew kindness. I pray thee unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. So he's saying to the butler, in three days, basically you're gonna be restored to your old job. But remember me, you following me? 15, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into this dungeon. So now only, now he's asking a man for help, and he's complaining. Do you see the complaining? Do you ever complain because something's unjust? Does it ever produce anything good? It never does. <coughs> Who likes a crybaby? No one, right? You ever want to hear somebody, you ever have that person that complains all the time? They just don't have anything good to say ever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, okay, it's good to be alive. Breath of life in your lungs. It's like, no. Everybody has one or more people like that in their lives, amen? And so it's interesting because this is a twist here. He's given him the gift to interpret dreams, and there he goes complaining promptly, immediately after. Why? Why? See, Joseph asked of man what only God could do, is the point. So, oh, uh, I'm telling you the dream. Everything's going to be good. Remember me because I was thrown in here and it's not fair, is what he said. Do you think that God is going to move when he's trusting in man? Was God going to move on his behalf when he's trusting in man? Absolutely not. The next thing is that he interpreted the baker's dream, and he told him that in three days he would be hanged and, his, and he would be eaten by animals. Ooh. Can you imagine? Great, I'm going to sit for three days, and I know I'm going down, and I'm going to be eaten to death, like hanged and then eaten. Terrible. 
Genesis 40, 21 to 23. And he restored the chief butler onto his butlership again, and he, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but he forgot him. He forgot Joseph. How quickly do you forget those people who help you? I'm talking about God should be those people, not people. Follow me? We got to remember God and everything that he's done for us, even when things are not going our way. This man, how quickly we forget, right? You ever do something amazing and someone's very thankful and then it's like it never happened? Anybody? Yes. Like, yes. What, what? What's the big deal? Think I owe you something? But God's not like that, you see. See, God, he didn't forget him. Amen? And God hasn't forgotten any of you where you are. Genesis 41, 1, and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. So he's in jail two more years. Can you imagine? He told this guy his dream. He doesn't know what happened, but he told his, his dream. He told the other one the other dream. He said, don't forget me, and he forgot him. Two years, two years after he complained and trusted man. How long are you waiting for your promise to come forth because you're a trusting man or woman and you're complaining in your situation? Anybody hear me here? It doesn't produce anything good. It delays your blessing. Complaining delays your blessing. Trusting in man delays your blessing. Because man will always fail us. And woman. Not because we're mean and nasty, but because we're not God. And we're not perfect. Amen? Genesis 41, 8 through 16 says, basically, that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt now, he had, guess what he had? A dream. And he, he, this dream drove him up the wall. He didn't know what on earth this dream meant, what was going on in this dream. So in this scripture here, 41, 8 through 16, it says that it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all of the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then, then finally the butler remembered. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wrought with his servants and put me in ward and captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed the dream in one night, said I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was with us a young man at Hebrew, captain ser uh, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream, he did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So he didn't try to answer for the dream. God gave him the answer, which would be peace. Amen? Amen. So he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, which was that, was that there was going to be seven years of famine, uh, of, of surplus, and then seven years of famine. Do you follow me? So it's interesting that God gave an Egyptian a dream, warning him of what was to come. Why did he do that? to show that he could work through anyone amen amen that's right and it's for the bigger picture as well so god gave joseph wisdom and instructions as to how the pharaoh should prepare and in genesis 41 39 through 46 this all basically says that he he said okay joseph you've interpreted the dreams now i'm going to have you basically you're wise and you know what you're talking about i'm paraphrasing so i'm going to put you in charge of planning for this time that we're going to have amen and it says in 42 that Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, his hand. And now he arrayed him in vestures of fine linen. So he's dressed again, except now he's dressed with the enemy's clothing. And he put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephnathaniah, and he gave him to his wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of priest of An. And Joseph went out all over the land, and he was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he went out from the presence of the Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. 
So a lot happened here. He interpreted his dream. He used God's gift that he's given him to interpret his dream. And in doing so, again, God lifted him, lifted him up out of jail now into the, my goodness, the palace. He was ruler. He was second in command, basically, in all of Egypt. And he was not Egyptian. He was an Israelite. Amen? Amen. And, and they look different. It's not like they look Egyptian. Amen? It's like me and whoever, the whitest person in here, the darkest person. We're not from the same, you know? God lifted Joseph up. He gave him divine favor and he prospered him even though he was in bondage, wrongly accused, and in the hands of his enemy. And by the way, he gave him a wife and two children. Isn't that amazing? The first child, his name is Ephraim, which means, excuse me, Manasseh, which means for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And then the second name was Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And he was made governor. We need to be careful about, like it's too late for me because I already have my three kids, but when I'm a grandmother, we need to pray about our children's names because they have meaning and significance. People name their kids some crazy stuff nowadays. I mean, I work in pediatrics, so I see newborns all the way through 21. It's like some crazy, crazy names. And a lot of it just has no, <laughs> it either has bad meaning, no meaning, or just cuckoo, you know? There's significance in the whole naming thing. And what we have here is we have that Joseph was given a new name, but it was not from God. He was given a new name from the enemy. The, fan, the famine finally came to pass. So they had seven years of surplus, and they saved, saved, saved. He, he saved one-fifth of everything, Joseph, amen? And when the famine hit, Egypt was okay, but the rest of the world was not okay. And guess who came around? The 11 hungry brothers. <laughs> You know, people come around when they're broken, hungry. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> Genesis 42, 1. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his son, now we're back to Israel, who is Jacob, who is Israel, right? Jacob is Israel, Israel is Jacob. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his, his sons, why do you look upon one another? Like, what are you doing sitting there? Go get some food. <clears throat> Can you imagine there's a famine and you have 11 strong men? What are you doing sitting there? Go and get some food, guys. Come on. So in Genesis 42, 2, to, 2 through 48, the 10 brothers went to Egypt to buy corn. Why only 10 brothers? Someone answer me, please. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. There was another, another son, and he was another favorite of Jacob. Yep, and his name was Desiree. You, could you say his name? <laughs> He kept Benjamin, Benjamin because Benjamin. That, that was the next when Joseph was gone. Right. So he kept Benjamin because why? Oh, maybe I, I have to read because okay. I think it was the last son that Rebecca had before she died. Yeah. And um, he had a new favorite. There was one other thing that happened to him, like something happened to mm -hmm. Joseph. Right, so he didn't learn his lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Why was Benjamin not good enough to go with the rest of the brothers? He still hadn't learned in his stubbornness. Amen? But if he was stubborn, thank God, have mercy on us, right? Again, he's an example of hope. We don't have to continue to walk in stubbornness and being hard-headed and, and, you know, unfair. And Benjamin was born from the same mother as Joseph. She had two kids, Joseph and Benjamin, and she died right after she had Benjamin. So he wanted to protect him. So dad sends the 10 with lots of money to Egypt to go and get some corn. And it says in the word of God that Joseph recognized them. Now, what would you do if you recognized that these are your brothers who threw you in a pit and sold you? Would you give them corn? Would you? No, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom? Like, honestly, what do you think you would do? I'm sorry? I'd be kind. I can't hear you. What? I would be kind. You would be kind? Not you. Go ahead, speak Off the truth. with your head. Like, seriously, off with your head. With that kind of power that he had, the power that Pharaoh gave him and the authority that he had, done. I'm sorry, you said. So she said, walk with his head, right? <coughs> All of them. Like Alice in Wonderland, like yeah. walk with your head. And the truth is, is that you know that Joseph had God in him, that God lived inside of Joseph, that he had the love of God in him, that he loved as God loved in order to not kill those boys. <laughs> because seriously, that's when the flesh rises up right there. And he has no Holy Spirit inside of him yet. Amen? So he recognized them, and he, he took them to the side, and he accused them of being spies. Who are you, and where do you come from? And he threw them in prison for three days. Interesting, three days. There's always symbolism in numbers in the Word of God. 
And, and then it says that he kept Simeon in prison and he released the rest of them with corn because he, they told him who they were, where they came from, and that they were, they were one of 12 and that one was gone and that the other one was back home. And guess who, uh, guess who Joseph wanted to see? His brother, of course, you know? So he said, okay, I'm gonna hold one of you and you come back. So they left and they left Simeon in prison and they, and they returned home. But when they got home, guess what they found? All their money in their satchets, their bags, the money with the corn. Now they were terrified. This guy who threw them in prison for three days, they tried to pay, they paid or so they thought, but now they returned home with all this corn all their money and their brother's still in Egypt in prison. Where do you go from here? How would you feel? Hungry? So you eat some corn, then what? They told their father everything that had happened, but guess what he did? He still said, you know what? I'm not sending Benjamin. So Benjamin's life was worth more than Simeon's life, again. And he wasn't being shy about it. He's like, I'm not doing it and that's it. Favoritism is toxic to family. Don't play favorites ever, never, ever, ever, ever. I speak to parents and I speak to grandparents and I speak to future parents. No favoritism ever, it doesn't work, amen? Even if they're nice as pie to you, they're the good one. There's no such thing as a good one, we're all bad. We are. How many of you are bad in here? Amen. Yeah, you gotta know the state of your heart. We're sinners, without God we're terrible. So, <laughs> Genesis 42, 38, and he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. And making excuses on top of it. If mischief will fall him, by the way, in which you go, then he shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So he's saying, I'm not sending Benjamin, because if something happens to him, I'm dying. I'm done. Genesis 43, 11, 15, and their father Israel said unto them, if it must be, so now do this. Take the best of the fruits in the land in your vessels, because guess what, Papa got hungry. He got really hungry, you know? So Israel, Jacob, he got really hungry, and he realized that not only was he hungry, all of his children were hungry, and his servants were hungry, and all of his people were hungry, so now he better act, or else people were gonna start dying. So he had to get over his favoritism, he had to get over his, um, his unfair behaviors, and he had to think rationally. He was being shaken up, literally, amen, and dying, because they were hungry. And it says that he told his children to take the best fruits in the land in your vessels, and carry them to down, down, the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices. Basically, he sent them with everything that they could give that was good, okay? Because remember, they returned with their money, so who knows what was gonna happen to these guys. I, did, I would be terrified, would you? I'm gonna go back now after, you know, what's going on here? And he said in 13, take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your, your other brother in Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And the men took the present, took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up and went down to Egypt. Genesis coming to the end. Genesis 43, 16 through 34. So they basically went, they went back to Joseph. They went back with all the goods they could possibly give, everything good. They said, when we got home, this is what we found. There was this, uh, our money was in the bag with the corn. We don't know how this happened, but we're back. And we have the money, we have twice as much money, plus all of these gifts for you now. And we brought our, our brother Benjamin. So Joseph actually saw his brother, his little brother. And basically they explained everything. And it says that he made a feast for them and he sat them. And, and he sat them in their birth order, which must have been pretty incredible to the brothers. How did he know? How strange is that, right? So what's happening here? And Joseph saw his brother Benjamin and he wept, he was moved. Genesis 44, they're bought, they're, again, they're going to leave. So they have this great feast. He doesn't reveal himself. He doesn't reveal anything. He goes and cries. It says that the Egyptians would eat in one place and that other people would eat in another place. And he sent them on their way. He gave them corn. They are off in Adam. All the brothers are going back to dad. And all of a sudden they're stopped dead in their tracks by Pharaoh's guards. And basically they, they look in their bags and they find um, Joseph's silver goblet, his big cup. See, someone stole um, Joseph's special cup. Someone stole his cup. So one of the brothers stole his cup. But the brothers didn't steal his cup. Joseph deliberately planted the cup in Benjamin's bag so that Benjamin would have to be with him. Do you see Joseph's plan here? He was being slick. 
He's like, okay, you can go. He didn't reveal who he was. He had this feast. He got paid for the, the stuff. He sent them away with this corn. He packed their bags real well. Everything was good. All the debt was settled. They were on their way back home to Israel until it was all part of Joseph's plan. Joseph sent and said, basically, if any of you have the, the goblet, you're done. You're coming back with me. And it was Benjamin. Everybody following me? Sorry, it's just a lot. Genesis 45, 1 through 13. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried. Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. So they basically all went back to the house, and he told them who he was. And he told them what he did, and he told them everything that he had been through, and he told them everything that God had delivered him from, and he told them and showed them God's mercy, God's favor, God's blessing throughout the entire story. And he said, go and get dad and everybody else. You guys are coming to live with me. And they went, and they told their father everything that had happened. And they basically said, leave everything behind. He told them, leave everything behind. Just come and bring everybody with you. And he brought everyone. And they went and lived in, in, in Egypt. And this was very unusual because why would, in a famine, why would any king in his right mind accept the multitude? Remember, we up until this point in Genesis, we were talking about all this land that they occupied. So much that Abraham and Lot and... Eight. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to focus. It is Abraham. Thank you. Like, Lot and Abraham had to separate because there were so many people. So we have Israel with all the ch all the wives back home, their kids, their servants, all of their household, and all these people are now going to come to Egypt and eat the food for that that, are, that has been reserved for the Egyptians, all because God's favor was on one man, Joseph. You follow me? So they came and they were presented to Pharaoh, and they were given a place. And, and because of everything that Joseph had gone through, we have the 12 tribes of, J of, of Israel. When you guys hear the 12 tribes of Israel, it's his 12 sons, okay? When you hear that, I want you to remember that the 12 tribes of Israel, these 12 tribes of Israel are 12 tribes because Joseph was obedient to God, because Joseph was obedient to God and because God's favor was on his life because regardless of what he went through he, he still stuck with God he stayed on that straight and narrow path he didn't get blindsided he didn't give up he uh, was beaten frustrated everything happened to this man sold and he forgave one of the biggest lessons in this is that he forgave regardless of everything bad that happened to him he didn't let anything stop him and he forgave his brothers he didn't try to take vengeance he did, we don't see him saying vengeance is from the Lord. We don't see him speaking any bad words against all these people with the, you know, this family that did these things to him. We don't hear anything. We don't hear him asking about his father. Nothing. He focused on God. And God is calling us like Joseph to focus on him, to stay focused on him. And regardless of whatever you've been through, because you all have some more stories. We all do, right? Just stick with God. Don't, don't get off that path. And if you're off, get right back on now. Get right back on. Don't look back. Stay focused. Because God still sees you in the midst of your problems. God still sees you in your place of misery, agony, and pain. God even sees you when you separate yourself from him. God sees you when you go to those places that you shouldn't go. God sees you when you say those things you shouldn't say. God sees you when you do those things that you shouldn't do. But God is faithful. And God sent Jesus to die for each and every one of us so that we wouldn't perish in our sin. So this is a story of... So many things that happen, but God is still calling and God is still on the throne. And God is saying tonight to all of you, sisters and brothers, it's not too late. Repent. Don't die in your sin. Don't perish where you are. I will see you through whatever it is we're going to go through. You're going to go hand in hand with God. God wants to hold your hand. God wants to be your strength. God wants to keep you focused. God wants to be the strong rock that in which you stand. God wants to be the God that he was to Joseph, to you and to me this night. Amen? Amen. Right, let's stand. And God will use his use our enemies to bless us, just like he used Pharaoh. Sisters and brothers, we need to bless our enemies. We need to stop cursing them and getting hot and bothered. Because we are enemies, right? 
We are enemies to the world because we're sons and daughters of God. If you accept that you're an enemy to the world, then you can cope a lot better. Understanding that you're highly favored, that you're sons and daughters of righteousness, that you are God's children, that you have been handpicked, that you have been chosen, that he knows you by name, that he will protect you, that he will provide for you, that he will keep you, that he will move mountains on your behalf, that he will take you from the miry clay, that he will pull you up, that he will guide you, that he will direct you, that he will save you, that he will bless you beyond belief. Some of you have never been blessed the way that God wants to bless you. And some of you have never been used the way that he wants to use you if you'll just let him. So, Father, I thank you for this story this night, Lord God. Thank you for Joseph, our brother, Lord God, in the Old Testament. We thank you that he gives us strength, Lord God. His story, Lord God, is such a strength. It's such an encouragement to us now. 